y'all probably know me. I'm one of the uh, CA2 anesthesia residents. Um, and Vivian asked me, as y'all are you're studying for the certification exams, which I'm grateful for, that VCU you know, encourages that for us to do it. Um, as, as PSU nurses, you don't always get to see the, the anesthesia aspect. Uh, you get them pre-op and you get them, you know, post pack you and really come there, make sure they're good, change clothes and let's go home in a lot of sense. Or make sure they're pain control or 23 hour observations, which is very important for you to understand some of these topics that we discuss. So what my ultimate goal today was just, you know, to discuss perioperative anesthesia review, just some topics here and there and uh, as we go through. I don't have any disclosures at this point um, in my career. Um, so biggest things we'll discuss common medications that we use within anesthesia. Uh, we'll discuss some anesthesia types, uh, meaning sedation versus general anesthesia, uh, and discuss the 2018 guidelines that were published by the uh, ASA, or the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, discuss some, some anesthetic concerns for certain populations, um, obesity patients, chronic pain patients, how can we help manage those from that aspect. Uh, y'all very involved in our regional technique aspect as we're doing them in the PSU. Uh, so very important that y'all understand what are we doing when we come in? What are our concerns when we come into these patients? Mention a little bit about ERAS as we're, uh, as we're ramping up our program here and coming out with those and as ways y'all can help participate in that. Um, and then uh, we'll, since the patients do come back to y'all and go home, uh, just some, some discharge instructions maybe, just some brief topics. And then we'll go over some questions after. Uh, I expect to be about 40, 40 minutes or so probably. Uh, I never time myself on these, I just <laughs> talk and I talk fast. So, uh, but we'll go ahead and start with just you know, our common medications, mainly IV anesthetic uh, agents that we use. Uh, what, these do, what these agents do is they exert sedative and hypnotic effects uh, with interaction to the GABA receptor, uh, which is an inhibitory receptor. So it, and most increases its function, causing an inhibition aspect. Uh, we do have agents that also work on an NMDA receptor and the alpha-2 receptors uh, within the brain. So some of these agents that you'll see we use, uh, maybe some of y'all may have heard of thiopental. I've never heard, uh, never seen that drug because uh, currently we don't have it in the United States. Uh, it was an old school drug. You talk to, to some of the guys around here who have been in practice for a while, so what they induced it. We don't use it anymore. The only barbiturate we use is methohexatol, and we use that in the uh, ECT unit with psychiatry. Um, the reason we use that, it's a very rapid acting drug. Um, we give it about one to two milligrams per kilogram, uh, and it does lower the seizure threshold. So therefore it enhances the seizure activity, it allows for closer seizures. So if we're trying to cause one, we wanna give every agent that we can um, to help that. Propofol, our, our go-to drug, Diprovan, as you see the brand name is a lot of it. It's a fat emulsion anesthetic. Actually the, uh, the founder of Propofol was fat, and I think it was in the, uh, 50s or 60s, I was reading it. So 50s, 60s, I was, anyway, I was reading in the, the, one of our journals, and he just won an award for this drug. We use it everywhere. I mean, we don't even just use it in the for induction of general anesthesia. We use it for sedation. We use it in um, uh, down in the endoscopy suite and procedure suites. And uh, it's a very nice drug to use. Uh, you have to be careful with it because it can cause apnea and even in smaller doses uh, and bolus doses. So we have to be very careful with it. But patients, you know get on to sleep and induce anesthesia and they wake up feeling rejuvenated and feel great afterwards, not rather than feeling after a burst out of fentanyl, very sluggish for you know 24 hours or so. Uh, this is the drug that Michael Jackson used. Okay? And that's why he, he'd get a small dose, he'd get a 25 minute nap and he felt like he could go for another 10 hours. Um, we give about two to three milligrams per kilogram for most adults as an induction agent. Uh, we'll see it uh, in kids, you may have to give a little more uh, for that. It uh, is rapid acting. It does cause some pain on injection. Uh, so a lot of times I'll, I'll give a little lidocaine uh, IV dose as well to sort of help with some of that, as well as lidocaine also can help with induction of anesthesia. Uh, it is a cardiac suppressant. It does cause a well vasodilatory effects, so you have to be careful with the hypotension and things like that we see with it and the apnea. Atomidate, another anesthetic agent that we use, it is the least cardiac suppressant an IV anesthetic. Um, dosing wise, 0.2 to 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. Um, biggest things about atomidate, it does cause some pain on injection as well. Uh, it's just how the pain of injection is the formulation, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's acidic. Uh, thoughts about atomidate, we had this atomidate debate in one of our grand rounds recently <laughs> about this. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it, but we talked about it, it inhibits the adrenocortical axis. 
axis. So we hear patients that are adrenally suppressed or need or on long acting steroids for a while, probably not the best agent to use. Uh, or patients who are, are septic and very sick, um, you have to be careful with it uh, because it can cause suppression of that axis, but it's the least cardiac suppressant. I mean, you don't get the hypotension that results with what you do with induction of H. Propofol. Uh, you do get some post-op nausea and vomiting and myoclonus with this agent as well. So actually on induction with the Tomidate, uh, you can see the myoclonic jerks. <laughs> Ketamine, another IV induction agent that we use very frequently uh, in multiple realms. Uh, it works at the NMDA receptor. Good thing about this drug, um, it's a sympathomimetic effect, so it actually increases the heart rate and blood pressure a little bit if you needed it. Um, it's got some analgesia properties. You usually can maintain spine, spontaneous ventilation with these agents. Uh, it does cause some bronchodilatation, uh, uh, which is a good thing for an asthmatic patient. So there are times when you have a chronic asthmatic patient uh, and prior to going, you know, needed to, other agents intubation and they're still actually bronchospasming, you can add ketamine and I actually relax the bronchial. So that's a, that's a plus for this medication as well. Uh, also known as vitamin K on the streets. So <laughs> you gotta be careful with that. Uh, we usually give about one to two milligrams per kilogram for this medication. Um, it does cause a lot of psychomimetic reactions. So there's hallucinations, um, dreams, vivid dreams. You hear during kids talking about it. So um, usually I try to give a little bit of the acid. Uh, Dexmedetomidine or Presidex, the alpha-2 agonist agent that we use, very nice uh, medication. Uh, it's a hypnotic, it's opioid sparing, it uh, doesn't really play with uh, the respiratory centers as well, so it doesn't cause apnea. Uh, we use it in the ICU a lot uh, as well. And so uh, the biggest thing of why it's, I guess, the opioid sparing aspect is it also affects the NMDA receptor. NMDA receptors are uh, part of the pain modulation. So. Mark, yes. what is an M MDA? N it's N-methyl, I'd have to look it up. Okay, that's the right Yeah, but the NMDA is what it's got. It's N-methyl, I should know that, but I don't off the top of my head. Okay, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's one of the receptors. A question. Yes. So, I've noticed, I mean, when they get the prosthetics, we have, like I know it says no respiratory depression, but then someone will sleep apnea already, can it cause further because I feel like we have some trouble with these patients if, if they already have sleep apnea, getting them to so, off the oxygen. Correct, yeah. So they have obstructive sleep apnea. That's where it can play a role. Um, it shouldn't. There was a, so Dr. Bruce Omena gave a talk. She is a very proponent of dexmedetomia or Presidex. And it's, it's, got its, it's got its recommendations and, and uses for, for various reasons. Um, but these patients who are obstructive sleep apnea patients, you're actually causing a sedative it's a longer acting sedative. Um, it does cause bradycardia, so we bolus it. Um, where it's acting on those alpha receptors can cause some bradycardia. Then we talked about uh, versed you know, a lot of us give, or midazolam. The benzodiazepines uh, increase the efficiency of that GABA receptor, uh, which is the um, inhibitory receptor in the brain. So it's an amnestic agent, meaning they just don't forget anything. I always joke, two, two shots of bourbon or a couple, couple of margaritas and uh, you know, patients feel pretty nice. It takes away some anxiety that a lot of patients get. Um, some patients, uh, a lot of times you hear uh, patients will get it in a moderate sedation case if it's just in a procedure suite and there's no anesthesiologist overseeing them, you'll see them do that as well. Um, loads of time it's usually, the dose that you can give, I usually just give one to two milligrams, so I wouldn't say the one to two milligrams per kilo, it's usually one Opioids, a big hot topic within the uh, United States right now with the, uh, the opioid epidemic that's unfortunately going around. Um, what, these in, what these medications do is they enhance immune and kappa receptors uh, in the brain and spinal cord to cause uh, analgesia or pain relief. They are respiratory uh, depressants, they are sedatives. Um, you can get hypotension and bradycardia with some of them. The histamine release by some opiates cause an itching and um, and rashes that some people talk about. Uh, they cause some urinary retention, so you have to be careful with that. Um, but we, we frequently use those within anesthesia uh, as appropriate and, and 
dose them accordingly. Uh, so I, I gave a couple uh, different um, agents that we tend to use. So fentanyl, very, very frequent synthetic opioid that we use. Uh, we usually give one to three mics per kilogram. Uh, very rapidly onset, easily titratable. Uh, tend to use it to blunt the sympathetic response from laryngoscopy. So I use my lidocaine and my fentanyl try to do that. Okay. Morphine, another uh, opiate that's longer acting, we all know this medication, one to four milligrams total uh, per dosing. It's got a slower peak time, longer duration. Um, the concern about morphine is in our patients who have renal disease, uh, which is what's tested on for us, the active metabolite uh, actually can, uh, can stay around a little longer. Um, so it's the morphine 6 glucuronidate, I think it is. You have to be careful with it. And then a lot of patients say, well, I was allergic to morphine because I got itching. It's because of the histamine release. So that's a big one there. Hydromorphone is a lot of, so you tend to see a lot of this use that, another synthetic opioid. Um, you don't get the histamine release from that. It's very long acting. Um, so you usually get a half a milligram to a Lepiridine is a, uh, another opioid that uh, we don't use, or Demerol is the name of it. We don't use it that much. To be honest, I don't think I've ever used it, uh, maybe once, uh, for post-op shivering. Um, and that's where you send it. We only use it now. We don't use it as an analgesic agent anymore um, due to that. It's got some anticholinergic properties, so you get some tachycardia with it. Um, and it also lowers the seizure threshold as well. It's an agent that we tend not to use much often. Intraoperatively, you may hear we come out and we ran a, a total intravenous anesthetic uh, or we ran an opioid infusion. Um, you can use a fentanyl infusion for that, but most people don't because uh, we want something more quicker. Uh, Acting so quick on, quick off. And um, so when you run an infusion, and I don't know if I included a picture, but there's far more dynamics of it. And, and one that we tend to use a lot uh, is Remy fentanyl. So this medication. Uh, it's very potent, it's very short acting, it's metabolized by plasma esterases, which indicates within the bloodstream there are enzymes that break this medication down. What that allows for um, is you don't have to worry about the liver or the kidneys di digesting it or breaking it down and therefore it can be inactive. It allows for a, a very timely fashion of understanding when the anesthetic agent will be done. Mm -hmm. You can also wake patients up on a really fentanyl infusion um, as the propofol wears off, for example. So in my neurosurgical cases, I will run a propofol and remy fentanyl infusion. We're done, pins are taken out, we're ready to wake up. So I turn my remy fentanyl off probably five or so minutes after the, the pins come out, because that's why I don't want them really to move. Or say, example, I turn the propofol off 25 minutes and I want to wake them up on the remy fentanyl. So you reduce the dose, turn the propofol off, give it about 20, 20 minutes or so. So you try to time it and uh, pins come out, and all of a sudden you tap on their shoulder, they're breathing spontaneously, and you see them open their eyes. It means they're coherent. They follow the commands, you take the breathing tube out, turn the remy off, and you're done. Um, and so they get some, some good, great analgesia intraoperatively. The hard part about that is postoperatively, shortly after, they get hyperalgesic because it's so potent, it's attacking the, the opioid receptors, um, and so then they start having a lot more. So you see them come out and you have to really dose your long-acting narcotic. So as the Remy fentanyl is broken down off the receptor, there's a long acting that takes its place. Mm -hmm. So would you get then another type of fentanyl that's a different level? So I would probably use a, probably hydromorphone at that point. Oh, I would okay. use a longer acting hydromorphone morphine. You could use fentanyl as well. Um, so you could try to dose that appropriately um, is an option that we do. Yep. Um, Sufentanil is another um, opiate infusion that we use. The liver transplants use it. Um, I used it on a kid the other day because um, I wanted to run a Teva, so I wanted to run a propofol infusion, and I wanted, as a young kid, and I wanted to run an opioid infusion. Um, and it was a, it was a neurosurgical case, um, and so we ran it that way. Um, the thing about uh, Sufentanil, the nice part about it, um, is it allows for a little extra, a longer time for post-operative analgesia. So, whereas Remy fentanyl will quickly wear off, and then you get the hyperalgesia, sufentanil will allow for a little prolonger. So I think that kid needed, I expect him to need an opioid just dose one time or something, you know, an hour and a half or 
or so after we got upstairs. And sure enough,